Welcome to Smarticus Tells His History. All right, enough with the echo and fanfare. You're here for history, right? And not that boring crap you learned in high school. This stuff's actually interesting. Like things you've never heard about the Civil War, Cleopatra, automobiles, Monopoly, the Black Plague, and more. Fascinating stories, interesting topics, and some downright weird facts from the past. It's a new twist on some stories you may know, and an interesting look at some things you may have never heard. So, grab a beer, kick back, and enjoy. Here's your host, Smarticus. Hello and welcome back to Smarticus Tells History, the podcast where I bring you the best and the most bizarre true stories you missed in history class. This week we are exploring the story of one incredibly badass female who had family ties to none other than Genghis Khan. Let's get started. You would be hard pressed to find someone who is unfamiliar with at least the name Genghis Khan. The notoriously brutal emperor who founded the Mongol Empire has definitely left his mark on history, art, literature, and even western pop culture. Very few rulers have rivaled Khan's barbarous reputation, and he's credited with more than 40 million deaths across the Asian continent. Khan produced a lineage that claimed many of their own spaces in the history books, but perhaps none were quite as fascinating as his great-great-granddaughter, Cotillion. Let's start a tale with a quick review of Genghis Khan, just in case you forgot how truly terrifying he was. Genghis Khan was born as Temujuin around 1162 near the border of Mongolia and Serbia. His childhood was consumed by violence and unpredictability. His mother had been kidnapped by his father and forced into marriage. Dozens of nomadic tribes on the Central Asian steppe were engaged in endless fighting and before he was 10, his father was poisoned by an enemy clan. Temujuin's clan deserted him, his mother, and his six siblings. While still a child, Temujuin murdered his half-brother and took his place as head of the family. He married his first wife in 1178, who gave him four sons and an unknown number of daughters. Temujuin began making alliances among the various clans, building a reputation as a warrior, and accruing a devoted group of followers. Perhaps because of his unusual childhood and family dynamic, Temujuin bucked all long-held customs and chose to place respected allies in key positions of power instead of his relatives. He executed leaders of enemy tribes and brought the remaining members into his own clan. By 1205, Temunjuin had rid the steppe of enemies. The following year, he called a meeting of representatives from all corners of the territory and established a nation that included nearly one million people. There he was proclaimed Chinggis Khan, which translates to roughly universal ruler. This name would later become Genghis Khan in the Western world. He abolished inherited aristocratic titles forbade the selling and kidnapping of women, and banned the enslavement of Mongol people. He also established a writing system, conducted a census, and allowed freedom of religion. And despite having a long association with carnage and brutal death, Khan actually outlawed the use of torture throughout his kingdom. Khan's first campaign outside of Mongolia was in northwestern China. They defeated the Jijia ruler before turning next to the Jin dynasty of northern China. Khan and his men ravaged the Chinese countryside, destroying food and sending refugees flooding to the cities searching for relief. The Jin Dynasty ruler handed over silk, silver, gold, and horses to Khan. In 1219, Khan set his sights on the Khwarezm Empire in what is present-day Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, and Iran after the Sultan betrayed Khan following a trade treaty. Khan's hordes swept over the empire, killing aristocrats and soldiers, and used unskilled workers as human shields during their next assault. When Khan returned to Mongolia in 1225, he controlled a territory that reached from the seas of Japan to the Caspian Sea. But never to forget a slight, he headed back to the Zhejia Kingdom, angered at their refusal to contribute troops to his fighting in Khwarezm. He was thrown from a horse during the campaign and died of internal injuries just before his men crushed the Zhejia for a second time. 
In just over two decades, Khan had united the Mongol confederations, became sole ruler of the Mongol plains, defeated the Zhejia dynasty and the Jin dynasty, and claimed the massive Khwarezm empire as his own, conquering more than twice as much as land as any other person in history. He was buried without markings, as was the custom of his tribe. Khan left behind an army of more than 129,000 men who were split between his descendants. His third son, Ogadai, was named his predecessor and under his rule, the Mongolian Empire reached its largest size ever. Ogadai's grandson, Kaidu, was Khan of the Chagatai Khananatai in Xinjiang and Central Asia during the 13th century. Kaidu led a force opposition to his Kublai Khan, his uncle, who ruled over the Mongol Empire. He spent more than 30 years at war with Kublai, but was never successful in breaking his power. It was to the fearsome Kaidu that Katuyan was born. His only daughter, the Mongolian princess, was Kaidu's undisputed favorite. Kaidu trained his daughter the same way he did her 14 brothers, in warfare on horseback, shooting a bow, swords, wrestling, hand-to-hand -hand combat, and other general badassery. Katuyan rode by her father's side into battle and was a trusted military and political advisor. Marco Polo had the pleasure of encountering the princess during his travels and wrote of her in The Travels of Marco Polo. The princess was so well made in all her limbs and so tall and strongly built that she might almost be taken for a giantess. He went on to add that when Contulian rode into battle, she charged headfirst into enemy lines to make a dash at the host of the enemy and seize some man thereout as deftly as a hawk pounces on a bird and carry him to her father. So renowned were her skills and intelligence that a stream of suitors was ready once she became of age. Cotillion's parents were prepared too. A great marriage could cement the family's power and give Kaidu leverage in his fight against Kublai. But, as is the case in any good princess story, the princess was not interested. But this princess was not one to throw herself across a bed and weep while silently cursing the pains of being royalty. Instead, she told everyone she would marry but had a caveat. Kutuyan would only agree to marry a man that could defeat her in a wrestling match and prove himself as her equal. Wrestling has been an important part of Mongol culture for centuries. Genghis Khan favored it as a way to keep his army in top shape. Mongolian wrestling doesn't look like the WWE, or sumo for that matter. Mongolian wrestlers use a range of techniques called mechs, based on their assessment of each other's opponents, strengths, and weaknesses. A highly skilled wrestler knows hundreds of mechs and exactly when to deploy them. The object of a match is to get an opponent to touch their back, knee, or elbow to the ground. Wrestlers use throws, trips, and lifts to topple their opponents, but striking, strangling, or locking an opponent is illegal. Before and after a match, each wrestler does a traditional eagle dance based on the flight of the mystical Garuda bird that symbolizes power, bravery, grace, and invincibility. Mongolian wrestling is more than a test of sheer strength. It also requires great intelligence, strategy, and endurance. Katulian had all of these characteristics in spades. The princess defeated the line of aristocratic and wealthy suitors with ease before issuing a general challenge. She would allow any man to wed her if he could best her in a match. Then, for spice, she decided any man that should fail would owe her ten horses for her trouble. By the time Marco Polo met the princess in 1280, she claimed to have a pasture with 10,000 horses and was still blissfully single. Author Hannah Jewell wrote of the extraordinary feat, The Mongolian steps were littered with the debris of shattered male egos. One particularly confident suitor bet a thousand horses on a wrestling match with Katuyan. According to legend, Katuyan's parents were nearly beside themselves at this point. The suitor was a good match, and they were ready for the whole affair to be over. So, before the match, they pulled the princess aside and asked her to throw it. She appeared to listen carefully to her parents' words, then stepped into the ring and, in Marco Polo's words, threw him, the suitor, valiantly on the palace pavement. Katuyan added a thousand horses to her pasture, and the suitor limped home. 
The princess remained undefeated for life, but did eventually marry, though the circumstances around it remain hazy. According to one account, Cotillion heard of rumors spreading that she was having an incestuous affair with her father and chose to marry a man without wrestling him first to protect both her father's reputation as a ruler and her own at being the best wrestler in Mongolia. But historian Rashid al-Din claims Cotillion simply fell in love and married a Mongol ruler in Persia named Ghazan. A third theory suggests that the princess married a prisoner who had failed to assassinate her father. The only fact that all the accounts agree on is that she took a husband without handing over her undefeated reign. Kaidu wished to name his very competent daughter as the next Khan following his death, but received heavy pressure from his 14 sons and relented. Cotillion's brother, Oris, was named the next ruler, and she agreed to give him her political support in exchange for a position as a commander of the military. The siblings worked in close alliance until Cotillion died in 1306. Cotillion has enjoyed a universal acceptance in her legacy, unlike her great-great-grandfather. Her story has served as the inspiration for artworks throughout Europe, an opera by the legendary Italian composer Giacomo Puccini, and dozens of novels. Genghis Khan, however, remains an incredibly divisive figure. He is credited with bringing the Silk Road under cohesive control, unifying the tribes, and introducing many progressive laws that improved the life for thousands. But, for many, the atrocities he committed are too great to overlook. Khan participated in the systematic destruction of cultures and people, leaving some historians to point to his campaigns across China as the first record of attempted genocide. And in Iran and other Islamic societies, his invasions are considered the beginning of a 200-year period known as the Mongol Catastrophe that resulted in the deaths of nearly three-fourths of the population. I do find it interesting to contemplate what Genghis Khan would have said of his great-great-granddaughter's exploits. Would he recognize her agency as a woman and allow her to remain unwed? Or would he have demanded her marriage to further the massive empire he was building? I think it's safe to say, whatever his feelings on his kin's approach to managing her matrimony, Khan himself would have been itching to know if he could beat her in a wrestling match. Thanks for joining me on this week's episode of Smarticus Tells History. Visit us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Tells History. If you are interested in helping our podcast grow, please consider donating to the show on PayPal. And if you're thinking of starting your own podcast, you can do so with ease on Buzzsprout. Check the link in the show notes to get started today. Thanks for listening to Smarticus Tells History. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to rate and review and make sure to subscribe. And be sure to follow the show at facebook.com slash tells history, or just click the link in the show description. Thanks again for listening. See you next time.